The following BLTV program is brought to you by O'Flaherty Law. Please enjoy. Hi, this is Heather Jones, a Wisconsin family law attorney with O'Flaherty Law. And today we're going to do a how-to video for filling out summons with minor children otherwise known as form FA-4104V. <clears throat> um, this video is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be nor should it be taken as a substitute for legal advice. If you are confused or have uh, a complex legal matter, it, we always strongly recommend that you consult with an experienced Wisconsin family law attorney to assist you. However, um, we're happy to do this video showing you how to go through properly filling out a summons with minor children in the state of Wisconsin. And there are explanations here on the left, but we like to go a little bit more in depth and give you a stronger idea of what this form is and why you need it and the proper way to make, make sure it gets filled out um, to the satisfaction of the court. So we'll just start right at the beginning and talk about the title, Summons with Minor Children. So if you found the form, you are petitioning for divorce or legal separation in the state of Wisconsin. And the summons needs to be included with the petition. What a summons is, it is the official notification to the other party that a legal proceeding has been started against them in the issuing court. So you always need to include a summons with a petition to make sure that the, the other party's due process rights are, are met and that they, they have a very clear idea of what is going on, where it's going on, and they can't come back and say, well, I had no idea about any of this. So it's all just hooey. Uh, you need to, to fill out a proper summons with each petition that you file with the court and this is the summons for a divorce or legal separation where there are minor children of the marriage. So starting at the top of the page, whatever county you're, you, file, you are filing your petition in is the same county you would be filing the summons in. You would be filing these together. Don't go into clerk of courts or don't get online to file your petition without a summons. You need the summons. So county, it'll be your county of residence where you meet the residency requirement to file for divorce or legal separation. Over here in the top right hand corner, don't put anything there. This is your no-fly zone. This, this section here belongs to the clerk of courts. This is where they do their clerk magic and file stamp your document. And it's really important, especially with these initiating documents, that they are properly file stamped and entered into the system because the date that they're file stamped, um, you know, goes to proper service. You need to make sure that everything is properly noted and put into the system so that everybody knows where we are at in the process. So here it says in regard to the marriage of, and then we'll put in the petitioner and the respondent. And you just need their contact information. Hopefully you know where, where um, as the filer or petitioner, hopefully you would know where the respondent is. If you don't know, because sometimes people just take off, um, you could just put last known address and just note, you know, last known address was and then you won't have a case number yet because this is one of the pieces of paperwork that starts the action. So the clerk of courts will give you a case number. So once you have the caption of the summons all dealt with, we'll move on to what the summons is all about. Like we said earlier, the summons is their official notice that a legal proceeding has been initiated against them in the issuing court. So we've got the, the explanation here for them. <clears throat> the state of Wisconsin to the person named above is a respondent. You are notified that your spouse has filed a lawsuit or other legal action against you. The petition, which is attached, states the nature and basis of the legal action. 
Within 20 days of receiving the summons, you must provide a written response, as that term is used in Chapter 802 of the Wisconsin Statutes, to the petition. The court may reject or disregard a response that does not follow the requirements of the statutes. And then it tells the respondent where they can send their response. They're going to have to send a copy to the clerk of court and that information will all be filled out here. It's all on the clerk of court's website, the county website for the clerk of court where you're filing. Then the name of the child support agency because again this is a summons for a petition for divorce or legal separation where there are minor children involved. So the county child support agency is going to want to know because they take a part in making sure that child support is adequate and that child support is paid. So we we have that the petition or the respondent has to give a copy of their response to the clerk of court in the county where the action is filed, the child support agency in the county where the action is filed, and then a response must also be mailed or delivered within 20 days to the petitioner at the address listed above in the caption. It is recommended but not required that you have an attorney help or represent you. If you do not provide a proper response within 20 days, the court may grant judgment against you and you may lose your right to object to anything that is or may be incorrect in the petition. So if you're the petitioner and the respondent just doesn't answer, even though, that they, have, even though they have received properly a copy of the summons and petition for divorce, um, you may just get everything you're asking for right off the bat, what, depending on what you have in your petition. Although if the other party is representing themselves, the court may cut them some slack, which is why they say you may lose your right to object to anything. It just, it's very situation dependent. It, you know, I hate to be a typical attorney here, but you know, when we look at this and we ask whether or not they 100% lose their right to object to anything, it depends. That's why this language says you may lose your right. A judgment may be enforced as provided by law. A judgment may also become a lien against any real estate you own now or in the future and also may be enforced by garnishment or seizure of property. So that really a lot of it goes to child support and possible spousal support. Um, if, they're order, if they don't show up to court and they're ordered to pay something and they just don't pay it, eventually you're going to get a judgment against them about it and in Wisconsin Money judgments do automatically attach to any real property owned in the state. And if it's child support, the child support agency who was noticed of the summons and noticed of the response, if any, um, could just find out where they work and start garnishing their, their paycheck. So here you'll see if you require reasonable accommodations due to a disability to participate in the court process, please call blank. So every county has its own phone number that you would call to talk to someone at the courthouse to see about reasonable accommodations, say if you're hard of hearing or you maybe can't walk that well or you need special seating, things of that nature. Um, it should be on the website, but if it's not, you can call them and just ask what number they want you to put in. So. This is not an, a notarized document, it's not a sworn document, but you do need to sign and print your name and put your contact information. Some attorneys do choose to use this form and as such there's a spot there for their state bar number, but obviously if you're not an attorney you won't have one and won't have to fill out the spot. So we've gone through what you would fill out, but let's talk about what you need to understand. So we have a section here called Important Notices. You are notified of the availability of information from the Family Court Commissioner as set forth in 767-105 of the Wisconsin Statutes. So this is some information for the respondent. Um, <clears throat> and this would be all of the law that governs requests to the Court Commissioner. And by the way, a Family Court Commissioner is, they're not technically a judge, but they are a very experienced attorney working under sort of the umbrella 
of the judge's power. They, um, there's so many cases in family court that it's, it's such a busy, busy place that it can really be hard to um, see everybody right away and to tend to everybody as quickly as possible. So they, they, have a, they have court commissioners, and you'll see it in family law. You can see it in juvenile law. You can see it even in some, some of the lower echelon criminal cases where the court has a commissioner. And that is just a highly, highly experienced attorney. In this case, it would be a highly experienced family law attorney who has been hired as a court commissioner to sit in on the bench and make decisions based on their extensive knowledge and extensive experience, but they aren't technically a judge, but their decisions count because they are working under the umbrella of the judge's power. So if you're looking for information from the family court commissioner, say you've received a summons and um, you, you need some more information, or you're trying to sue and you need some more information, these are, these are the things you can get from the family court commissioner. And you can get documents, you can get some procedure help, you can get access to community resources, you can talk about the major issues usually addressed in such an action, and what you need to get a judgment or an order. So these are some of the things that the family court commissioner can help you with. Then we have a warning. And this warning is something not to be taken lightly. It is interference with custody by parent or others. And that means grandparents, uncles and aunts, close family friends, any of that. So if someone is in a divorce proceeding, the legal custodian of a child, or it could be a paternity, you know, any of the issues that they, they lay down here. Um, if, if you try to snatch the kid with intent to, to deprive the custodian of his or her custody rights, that's a felony. Now, if you have an order in place saying that you can take the child for visitation, then it's not. But they point out the fact that joint legal custody has been awarded to both parents by a court does not preclude a court from finding that one parent has committed a violation of the paragraph. So what they're saying here is that there's going to be an order regarding physical placement and legal custody. And if you violate that order, either a temporary order or a more permanent order, you could get in a lot of trouble. And they want you thinking about that right away from the beginning because divorces can be very emotionally tumultuous times. Uh, there are times when you just feel like your, your rights aren't being properly represented or recognized, and people just get very emotional, especially when it comes to their children. So that is why, you know, a lot of times parents will snatch. Parents will snatch kids and run off. And it's you can't do that. They're, they're telling you right up front, don't do it. Don't have a friend do it. Don't have your mom or dad do it. Don't snatch. Just you have to work with the system on this. Also, if for instance, any parent or any person acting pursuant to directions from the parents. So if you have a buddy and you tell him, hey, you know, that I can't see my kids right now and it's killing me. I need you to go grab them from school because they know you, you know, Uncle Jim, and bring them to me and we're, we're going to hit the road. Uncle Jim's going to be guilty of a felony too. You can't hide the children. Um, you can't cause the child to leave with intent to deprive the other parent of physical custody. If there's a temporary or final order specifying joint legal, if you take the child outside of the order or withhold a child outside of the order, you're going to be in big trouble. The only, the only way you can get out of getting into big trouble for snatching is when you have a reasonable belief there's a threat of physical harm or sexual assault. Or 
if the other parent consents. And boy, you want to have that consent in some kind of writing, like a text. Of course, if you raise that defense in course in court, you're going to need to you're going to need to prove it. So <clears throat> those are some of the the big warnings. Uh, five just handles venue. But you're filing in the in your in your county of residency, so that should be great. The court may order violations or violator to pay restitution regardless of whether the violator is pay, placed on probation. Um, if you take the kid and you cost people time and money to recover the kid, the court may say you have to pay restitution, regardless of whether or not you're on probation. So the reasonable expenses incurred by a person or any governmental entity in locating and returning the child, any such amounts paid by the violator shall be paid to the person or governmental entity which incurred the expense on a prorated basis. Upon the application of any interested party, the court shall hold an evidentiary hearing to determine the amount of reasonable ex expenses. So. Let's say there's an order in place and the non-custodial parent snatches the child and disappears for a week and the other parent spends a week off of work traveling the state, visiting friends and family, trying to locate the child. Those expenses, and eventually recovers the child, those expenses, um, they can apply to the court for them to be reimbursed or to be, to order for restitution. So I guess that's just something, you know, you need to keep in mind uh, prior to doing any snatching. Just don't snatch is the bottom line here. But yeah, these are all the penalties for just trying to go outside of the system to interfere with custody. And that's all laid out to you in the very beginning. So uh, there should be no excuse. You have no excuse for saying you didn't know if you are the person receiving a summons and you decide to go kidnap your child, um, you've already been informed as far as, as the court of law is concerned. A quick note with all of these Wisconsin Circuit Court forms, don't modify them. There's very little reason to modify the summons, but if you feel the need to add some type of additional information to it, you could put it on a separate sheet of paper, that's fine. And just remember, the summons has to be completed and signed fully when you file it with your petition for divorce or your petition for legal separation. So that, in a nutshell, is Form FA-4104V, the summons with minor children. You use a different form if there are no children of the marriage. And um, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to learn more about family law and divorce in Wisconsin, you can visit our page. It's linked below. Be sure to leave any questions that you have in the comments section, and you can subscribe for more legal content daily. And uh, thank you again for listening. I wish you the best of luck with your legal matter. Hi again, this is Kevin O'Flaherty from O'Flaherty Law. I hope you enjoyed the video and podcast. If you did, I'd love it if you'd subscribe to our channel. If you need legal help in this or any other area of law, please don't hesitate to reach out to schedule a consultation. Most consultations are free and can be conducted remotely if you'd like. You can email us, book online, or call us at 414-253-2080. That's 414-253-2080. We have many locations for your convenience and we serve all of Wisconsin. Thanks again for watching.